Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Xu Qianduo. The week-long 20th CPC National Congress had drawn to a close with the newly elected Standing Committee members of the Political Bureau, the highest decision-making body of the CPC, meeting the press on Sunday. What are the expectations for China's development for the next five years? How will the country face future domestic and foreign issues? And what do China's neighbors in the region think of the recent Congress and China's economic policies for the future? To find out more, I'm joined today by Jayanath Kalambaj, former chief of the Sri Lankan Navy for the first half of the program. Earlier, I also spoke with Jasnan Plavnik, president of the Geoeconomic Forum Croatia, for her thoughts on this topic in the second half of the program. Welcome to the discussion, Mr. Kalambaj. You know, the National Congress of the CPC has just concluded in Beijing. Uh, it touched upon basically a wide range of topics uh, related to China's future, China's development. So in terms of this, uh, the points you know, talked about by uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, what struck you as the most crucial uh, point probably to China's development, to China, for China to meet its challenges, for example? Okay, uh, thank you for having me on your great show. So let me first congratulate President Xi and the newly elected standing committee members of the Politburo uh, for a successful completion of the 20th Congress. And with great hope, uh, stepping on to the next uh, maybe 100 years or so. Uh, so let me uh, uh, offer my congratulations first. As we all know, the world is going through a very difficult time. We had the COVID-19 pandemic. And no sooner the pandemic was almost over, we have the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. And then we are witnessing extreme weather events across the globe. And the world is more or less getting ready for an economic recession. And there are scarcity of fuel, gas, food. So the, the 20th Congress, to me, came in this backdrop uh, in the world. So therefore, I think it is important not only for China, but for the whole world, because China is an emerging power, and China has about you know uh, one uh, fifth of the population of the world. It's a huge population. So therefore, I always believe that world need China, China need world. So therefore, whatever China is going to do during the next 10, 20, 30 years, is going to impact the world. So I look at the uh, the 20th Congress uh, through that angle. And we know that China is now moved away from uh, a society of uh, moderate prosperity into a great modern socialist country. Uh, that is the objective for the next uh, 100 years. Now, you ask the question, out of all these things, what struck me most? Honestly, it is the people first leadership. That aspect really struck me the most. Of course, there are so many things in the con uh, in the uh, the Congress. Uh, I mean, the amending on of the Constitution and so many ambitious. But to me, when I went through that, I realized, or to me, I think the people first leadership that is our topmost for my agenda. Because, you know, when you are trying to modernize, when you are trying to modernize a humanity, uh, one-fifth of the world humanity, right, for a common prosperity, that argues extremely well, not only for China, but for the people. And also, you are, I think you are talking about harmonizing people, all people of all uh, ethnicities, all religions across the, the country, and uh, you are targeting peaceful development. Now, mm -hmm. build China into a great modern socialist country, and that would definitely contribute to the progress of the entire world. Uh, I know that you have a abandoned ex experience you know, in foreign relations. Uh, China has uh, reiterated its uh, dedication uh, to promoting a human community with a shared future. And uh, again, it is said it will never seek hegemony or engage in expansionism. Uh, Xi Jinping said, you know, China endeavors to strengthen solidarity and cooperation with other developing countries and safeguard the common interests of the developing world. Uh, as a neighbor, uh, you know, neighboring country of China, how does Sri Lanka view and see China's foreign policy direction? 
Well, I think China is a very strong player in the international domain. You know, nobody can push China out and say, you're not important. China is critically important in the international domain. So whatever the policies that China is coming out with is going to matter to the entire world, peace, prosperity, and economic prosperity of the entire world. So in the, in the, uh, the, the 20th Congress, I think China has reiterated their dedication to promoting a human community with a shared future. Now, this word shared future uh, is interpreted differently by different leaders, right? Now, don't we all need a good future? We need a good future for the whole world. But what do we actually see? We don't see uh, many countries are thinking of a shared future. They want a future only for their people. So what I see in the 20th Congress is that commitment to maintain a community with a shared future. I think it goes beyond the population of China. You know, when you talk about a community with a shared future, not only the 1.43 billion Chinese people, I think the Chinese uh, Congress is talking about the world at large. So therefore, that foreign policy perspective is critically important to the world at, at this juncture. And also, there are two other things that uh, Chinese, uh, the, the 20th Congress has come out with, that you will never ever seek hegemony or you will not engage in expansion, right? These are two things that we do see taking place in the world. It may not be direct military attack, but it can be in some other form. And especially when with the living in the Indian Ocean, we do witness a large number of hegemonic players with players with hegemonic intention. They're trying to be only one, only themselves. So in that sense, the guarantee that China has given that it will not seek any hegemony in the world and it will not engage in expansion is really great for the entire world. Now, we know that the world is divided. We are divided global north, global south. We are divided on income. We are divided on religion. We are divided on resources. We are divided in whatever the possible way that we can think of. So in that sense that I think Chinese objective of a community of shared future is really great for me. And I think you will you should you will be able to uh, walk the talk now. I mean, you have stated your objectives and if you can achieve it, you know, then the world can achieve uh, uh, the hope of a shared uh, future. Now in that, I think it is like uh, when, when China is thinking of a community of a shared future, the interdependence come, the interdependence among people mutual benefit of among the people will come mutual prosperity mutually rewarding benefits will come and above all people to people contacts will matter so in all essence i think community of shared future is great important it is a must for the entire world right now and not having any hegemonic intention stating in your policy document that's a great thing Yes, right? I mean, yes. not many countries have done that. No, so very few I think would this say really that great. publicly. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, they, nobody has said it in publicly, but here you're stating it more or less in a public way mm -hmm. that you don't have any hegemonic intentions. You don't want, I think, I believe when you look at the history, China has really never ever attacked another country and occupied. So that's, I think that's your history. So, um, you know, when you think of the the Indo Pacific, uh, especially, you know, the Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific, we do witness a strategic competition every day. We do witness a strategic competition and strategic convergence, you know, some uh, countries getting together against, I mean, in this case, against China. And then the worst thing is they want us to choose between the sides. They want us to, uh, they are kind of forcing smaller countries to choose 
we don't want to choose between uh, this or that. We want to benefit from all the countries possible. So right. this is the competition. Right. Well, speak of that, uh, Mr. Columbus, you know, on this uh, very sensitive and also important issue of Taiwan question. Uh, Xi Jinping said that at the opening session that uh, you know, China will continue to strive for peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and the utmost effort, uh, but will never promise to renounce the military option. Uh, how do you make of that Taiwan question? How do you make of you know, this uh, tension across the Taiwan Strait? The world does not need another conflict, right? The world does not need another conflict. Now we, you know, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, I was the foreign secretary. We firmly believe in one China policy. For us, it's only one China, right? There is no separate uh, 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 country other than China. And we have stated this in no uncertain terms in every international forum. Uh, that we believe in one China policy. So we will maintain that not only Sri Lanka, many other countries in the world, they do believe in, uh, they do accept the one China policy. So therefore, right, and uh, as mentioned in the, in the documents, that peaceful re reunification is the best way to go, right? Peaceful reunification is in the interest of China, is in the interest of people in Taiwan, is in the interest of the rest of the world, right? So therefore, you know, I, I, I am coming from a country which was conflict-ridden for nearly three decades. And we realize at the end of a war, there is no victor. Everyone has lost. Everyone has lost in a war. Whoever loses little less than the other can be the victor. So mm -hmm. therefore, uh, and also I must mention, we do see many countries are trying to fuel tension in the Taiwan issue, right? So I believe, I, I hope that China will not fall into that trap. You know, China will not, uh, I mean, hold firm and you will do everything possible through negotiation, whatever is the way possible. Uh, uh, of course, no country can say we are not going to use military uh, as the last resort. You should never say that. I mean... You must always keep that option open, but right. that should be the last and the last and the last option. Yes, last option. And Xi Jinping was uh, elected uh, General Secretary of the 20th Central Committee of the CPC. So w what's the significance of having a strong leadership and this continuity of development direction and uh, uh, policies, politics of this country? Well, you see, I, I am a firm believer that uh, strong committed and dedicated leadership mm -hmm. is a must to the development or the progress of any country. And we have seen that uh, with many experiences, many examples, right? When you have weak leaders, when you don't have the mandate of the people, uh, when the leader is not really thinking of the people, a country is not prospering at all, right? And also uh, the Chinese leadership, I think, over the period of last decade or so, they have really moved towards people-first leadership. I think it was one of the, the policies of President Xi Jinping, the people-first. I mean, that is why I think uh, the Communist Party embarked on alleviating absolute poverty from China. And you did it, right? Because you wanted people to be out of poverty, right? So I, I mean, I think uh, it's a massive effort at various levels of the government from Beijing to the most rural village in China, right? And then you uplift a population of 100 million. Now that can be done only with a strong and committed leadership, right? Now, another thing is leadership should be strong, but it should sustain for a long time also. Right? So this is actually a problem with uh, the Western-style democracy. They change the leaders so often. Now look at few countries in the West. Every six months, there is a new leader. Right? So this is a problem for the progress of a country. Right? It is not in the interest. I, I mean, if you look at these countries, it is not the people who wanted the leader change. It is the political elite get together, and they say, OK, you're not good. Now we need another leader. 
it, it won't work, right? I mean, it will not definitely work in a, a big country, a huge population uh, like China, right? So what we need is a very strong, sustaining leadership. For a, then only the leader can make decisions uh, for the future. Leader can make decisions with a vision. Otherwise, uh, if you look at the Western-style democracy, the leaders work only for four to five years, right? Because their tenure is limited. They cannot think of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line. So therefore, I would argue that we need a strong and sustaining leadership for the prospect of a country. And I do see these qualities in uh, President Xi Jinping, and I wish him good luck. Uh, and of course, the new uh, the, the Politburo members that, that you will be able to achieve your objectives. Thank you, Mr. Klambage, for your time and insights. Next is my interview with Jasna Plavnik, president of the Geoeconomic Forum Croatia, for her thoughts on this topic. China as a country, it gives to its people everything. Chinese people give back a lot to China, and that is because of good governance. The Pauji Sag Bridge in the south of Croatia, you know, open it to traffic. It stands as some kind of ground in this relations between China and uh, Croatia. This kind of cooperation should stand as a model that should be further developed and uh, further used. Welcome to the discussion, Jasna. While countries practice different political systems, and you know, good governance is always probably the yardstick you know, to measure the performance of a particular government. Uh, as a long-time China observer, you know, what do you think you know, lies at the core of China's governance model? And how would you comment on the leadership of the CPC, for example? China as a country, uh, this country has a beautiful, beautiful nature, uh, many natural resources. and. Uh, it gives to its people everything. And on the other side, Chinese people gives back a lot to China, and that is because of good governance. And I think that in that Chinese model of governance uh, is based on meritocracy. And that is uh, what, uh, what helps China uh, to make such a, such a historical a move forward in uh, many area uh, and that is the reason uh, why now china is uh, the, the most advanced among the most advanced uh, technological and economic countries uh, now it seems that west uh, has a problem with this chinese model uh, of, of, of chinese uh, society model political model but but it's so I would say so strange because it is not breaking news. China always had and before had uh, um, socialism with um, Chinese characteristics, right. and uh, it, it, it had it in 1970, in oh. 1975. It, it uh, has it now, and uh, it's for me it's so some kind uh, uh, funny to 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 put this system as uh, some obstacles to further cooperation. I would say that this, the problem that this kind of model has proved itself as successful. Uh, well, Croatia is an Asian nation and yet a very young nation state. You know, that's probably why uh, many Chinese are not that familiar with your country. Uh, how do you introduce Croatia to our viewers, you know, both in China and overseas? Uh, Croatia has about uh, close to four uh, billion, uh, four uh, million uh, pe uh, people. Uh, uh, I would say that the uh, country is uh, very uh, uh, clean. Uh, it has a lovely uh, coast. Uh, uh, Croatia has also uh, the uh, largest supply of supplies of uh, drinking water in the European Union. Also, I have to stress that when um, we are talking out, uh, about Croatia, Croatian diplomacy uh, between uh, diplomacy between China and Croatia, 
then it's unthinkable to not mention the name of Marco Polo, uh, the famous explorer and writer. And I would say, though he is, uh, uh, there's many things that he is born at uh, Croatian island Korčula. At the time, this island was under the uh, power of uh, Venetia, Venetian power. But uh, there is also some kind of um, uh, uh, birth uh, uh, home of uh, Marco Polo at, at Korčula Island. And it is very interesting uh, to see it. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there is some kind of, you know, that, that there is some kind of quarrel between Italians and Croatians about who who's Marco Polo is. I, in my opinion, it's not so important. Uh, I think that uh, if it is a meat or it is a history, it is uh, interesting both. It is, yeah. uh, it is uh, interesting to see and to talk about the, these things. Mm -hmm. Well, a uh, nice place to visit, to see history and also, of course, the beauty of the country. Uh, well, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Croatia and China. You know, how would you characterize the history of the bilateral ties and, and where the relationship is right now? I think that relationships now are right uh, at the level of very closeness between the two countries. Uh, also, I have to remind that these relations, these ties, have started in a very hard time for Croatia in 1992, when, when Croatia fought for its sovereignty and for its territorial integrity. And uh, at the moment, China's creation, uh, uh, China's recognition was uh, some kind of very great support to Croatia's national aims, and uh, also it improved. Uh, Croatia, uh, Croatian position, position in international relations. Uh, there are many, uh, there are many uh, significant events in that sh uh, relatively short history. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, 2009, uh, former president of China, Hu Jintao, visited Zagreb. And that was a very important uh, foreign policy event because it was not just uh, the first visit of such high level officials to Croatia, but also to the uh, first visit to the region, to Southeast Europe. But uh, uh, in my opinion, the real breakthrough in international rela in relations between China and Croatia has come when China launched two initiatives, uh, one for Europe, that is uh, China uh, Central, Central East European mechanism, and other one is the Belt and Road. And uh, through these uh, initiatives for, for Croatia and China has been possible to improve their relations both at bilateral level and multilateral level. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I must say just one word because it's very important that uh, China also uh, helped Croatia uh, during the pandemic. China was the first that helped Croatia and uh, sent uh, medical equipment to Croatia. And I think that move is uh, uh, unforgettable uh, because uh, at that time in European Union, uh, the biggest uh, country of the European Union uh, um, banned export of this equipment. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, in late July, uh, we know there's a, a very milestone event uh, for your nation, you know, the Pauji Sag Bridge in the south of Croatia, you know, opened to traffic. The bridge was constructed by a Chinese company, founded, co-founded by the e European Union. And both your president and the prime minister attended the opening ceremony. And the Chinese premier, Li Keqiang, also addressed the event through a video link, you know. Uh, so what does the project mean, you know, for Croatia ties as well as the Chinese investment uh, in the European Union, for example? Uh, I would say that this, uh, this bridge, Vyashat's bridge, uh, uh, stands, I would say, it stands as some kind of crown in this relations between China and uh, Croatia, because it's very important uh, projects for Croatia. The bridge connected uh, uh, south 
the Dalmatia south of Croatia with the mainland. So it was a long dream of Croatian people uh, about that bridge, to have that kind of bridge. And on the other side, for, uh, for, Croatia, for Chinese companies, uh, this uh, bridge stand as some show bridge uh, for the European Union and other countries uh, to see how Chinese uh, companies are capable and how they are capable to, to, to not, not just to make that kind of uh, very complicated construction, but also to follow the, the, uh, the date uh, to, to, to make it on time. And uh, uh, this bridge is also uh, one success, is a, a successful story uh, about three cooperation, about three sides between European Union, which shared funds from its uh, 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 fund from, from fund from its uh, uh, solidarity and uh, 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 solidarity program, uh, and uh, on the other side is uh, China side that that has made construction and also Croatia which uh, invested uh, the rest of the fund needed for building the bridge. So I think that this, this kind of cooperation should stand as a model that should be further developed and uh, further used. Uh, I must say that uh, things uh, were not so rosy as it's today, because uh, when um, Croatia in April in 2080 uh, signed an agreement with Chinese company uh, to build that uh, bridge. Uh, there was a lot of complaints uh, from um, uh, European companies. For example, uh, European uh, company, Austrian company, precisely Austrian company Strabag, uh, which uh, complains publicly that uh, this uh, uh, job worth about 420 uh, million euros uh, uh, is actually uh, given to China because of China's company price were too low and they insisted that this was some kind of dumping. But uh, all, it was not the end. But also from the European uh, uh, Commission, one of the commissioner, Austrian commissioner, he also criticized the Croatian government because of it, but at the end, the uh, Croatian government rejected all these uh, uh, complaints and the European Commission uh, confirmed that all procedures were in accordance to the uh, European law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and standards. Well, with that, we come to the end uh, for the discussion. Many thanks to Dr. Jasna Plavnik. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.